I'm Jonathan Arnold, one of your hosts this evening, and it's an honor to have Dr. Tom McCall with us to present on the Cappadocian Fathers. Uh, Dr. Fry, our co-host this evening, we'll introduce him in a moment, but I uh, just wanted to begin with a few words about our ministry. Holy Joys exist to bring theology to bear on the beliefs and practices of local churches, especially in the Wesleyan tradition, so that they can be more holy and happy. Uh, this includes our strong commitment to Methodist Catholicity, uh, tapping into the riches of our ancient faith to help serve the needs of the contemporary church. And our Ad Fontes reading group has been one effort in this direction. So far this year, we've read selections from Irenaeus, Tertullian, Origen, uh, Hilary Poitier, and two of the Cappadocian fathers, Basil the Great and Gregory of Nyssa. And next month, we'll be reading my favorite Cappadocian, Gregory of Nazianzus. Uh, some of the 28 pastors, students, and educators in our group were unable to be here tonight, but this will be recorded, shared with them, and then published online for a wider audience. And you can watch for that video at holyjoys.org, as well as on the Holy Joys podcast, where Dr. David Fry and I have weekly discussions on theology and ministry practice. Uh, so with that said, Dr. Fry, you can go ahead and give a, a more formal introduction to our speaker. Thank you, Jonathan. And it's great to have my friend and mentor, uh, Tom McCall, uh, with us tonight. And I missed being with him last year at Aldersgate. And I think you are scheduled to be there this year. Is that correct? I think so. Yeah, good, yeah. good. So I, I, we definitely do not want to miss that. So our listeners, I know many of our listeners are um, associated with that as well. Uh, so keep that on your calendar. Uh, Tom McCall is the uh, Tenant Chair of Theology at Asbury Theological Seminary. Um, he previously spent 16 years, I believe, at uh, Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. And uh, I actually, I don't remember if I, that may have been where I met you when you were there the day to interview. I was there to, uh, to visit the school uh, to, to determine if that's uh, if I wanted to apply for a PhD and we both ended up there. Uh, Tom became my advisor uh, through my uh, uh, PhD dissertation and I so appreciate uh, his investment uh, in my life. I w I've had the privilege to be in his home many times and um, we'll try not to have too much personal uh, you know catching up in this recording but uh, appreciate him and his family, uh, awesome family and uh, uh, I know Tom uh, uh, loves his family and his, his four kids uh, who are all pretty much grown up, it seems like, uh, as well. So um, that's, yeah, it's hard to believe. Uh, there, are, there are so many books. Uh, you have, uh, uh, our listeners have come across your books. Uh, I mentioned Aldersgate. We'll be talking about your book on sin, Theology of Sin, that came out uh, a couple of years ago. I look forward to that. I think um, this year or, or recently, uh, Analytic Christology, and uh, there's more to the title, but that just came out. Is that correct? I don't have that. I look forward to Okay, there it is. All right, there it is for, all right, on the video. So those who are watching uh, can see that. Uh, so that's just come out, and he has authored numerous books, all sorts of articles, essays, uh, edited a ton of works and you'll find him uh, anywhere uh, if there's a collection of, of scholarly essays. Uh, the, I just um, saw your article in the uh, TNT Clark on analytic theology on the Trinity. I noticed that as well. So just all over the place. Uh, he, he, he loves God. He loves the church. He does theology for the church. And that's why I appreciate about him. So he's going to introduce the Cappadocians to us. And uh, so I'm just going to turn it over to him, and then we'll have some Q&A at the end. Thanks for being with us, Tom. Thank you. Um, are you hearing me okay? Yes. Okay, good. So uh, first, let me just say um, thank you for this opportunity. And um, I'm really grateful to, happy to talk about the, these, these issues and these uh, theologians. And I just also want to say I appreciate the work you guys are doing a lot. Uh, I've been watching um, work from afar for a while. Uh, I just think it's a great idea, and it looks like, to me, really good execution overall. Um, uh, really, really impressed, and, and we're just, I want to encourage you guys to 
keep up the good work and do more of it. I'm, I'm just thrilled. Um, I wish, wish, wish there would have been something like this for me, you know, 20, 25 years ago, um, uh, starting out as a pastor and as a theology student. Um, so I think it's great. And I really want to affirm what you're doing. And um, I'm, a, I'm a big fan. So um, thank you. And thanks for letting me be a big, a little part of it. So here's what I want to do um, in, in our time together today. So first, um, and this part will be the, probably the briefest, it will just be a brief uh, biographical sketch, uh, just an overview of, of who Gregory of Nyssa was. Secondly, and this will be the bigger chunk, will be a, an overview of some of the major, or the major fourth century um, controversies. So um, no one, of course, works in a vacuum and no one it lives on an island and there is no such thing as sort of timeless theology that just sort of pops in from nowhere for everyone every everything is written with a purpose to an audience uh in a particular context and location and intellectual context as well as distinct pastoral challenges and gregory of Ness is no exception so we to spend more time probably looking at that and hopefully that will help not only with the reading of gregory of not of nissa but also um, the Gregor Nazianzus reading and the Basel of Caesarea reading, since all of that is really relevant. And then the third and last thing um, I want to do is just offer a few comments on some of the major theological themes. I won't be doing much on some of the quote unquote hot topics in, uh, in Nissen studies these days. Um, historical theologians who are looking for the next thing uh, tended to focus on, on issues that are um, well, they're interesting in their own right, but they're not, I don't take them to be at the core of what he was doing or, or in his context. So we're going to focus on, um, on the ones that were more pastorally urgent and theologically um, core for him. So those are, the, those are the things. And then we'll have time for quite Q&A and just some discussion of any of these things or other things um, after that. So who was Gerger Nyssa? Born in 335 AD to um, a family of 10. He was one of 10 children. Um, he was a younger brother of Basil of Caesarea, a brother notably of Macrina the Younger. Um, Macrina the Elder was his mother. Macrina the Younger was his sister. And she's noteworthy in all of these discussions because she's a really important figure that's just behind the scenes. And, you know, sometimes historians talk about very important figures behind the scenes, and it, you don't really know what to make of that because your influence is notoriously hard to track in, in, his, in intellectual history. Just the fact that some person A said something, and years later someone B said the same thing or a similar thing doesn't mean they got it from A. Um, but in this case, it's different. And it's different largely because Gregory's own witness is that he really learned theology from her. Like she was this massive formative, um, formative theologian in his own life. So even though we don't have extant uh, works from her, uh, by his own admission, by his own testimony, he, he gets the good stuff from her, or at least a great deal of it. Um, so he learned a lot from his older brother, Basil, and uh, his sister, Macrina, as well as others. Um, his good friend, Gregor of Nantiansis, um, and he were both appointed bishops to bishoprics. Uh, both of them, I guess, uh, didn't seek these out, but were appointed by Basel um, to, help, to help the cause and to some moderate success. Uh, Gregory and Basel, well, both Gregory's and Basel are more known, you know, in, in our discussions and in these circles for their theological treatises. I mean, that's what we have left, that's what's here. But I think it would be remiss not to at least note their pastoral um, agency and the work they did as pastors, and even specifically their work in, um, I mean, almost any term we use these days is, is somewhat loaded politically, so we've got to be careful here. But their concern for what we, I don't know what else to call them, but just deeply Christian involvement in social issues. So. Um, some of the first hostels and hospitals come from the Cappadocians, the ministry of the Cappadocians. Um, Gregory of Nazianzus is famously and, and at the time notoriously 
um, anti-slavery all the way down. Um, no compromises, no excuses, no middle ground. Um, he was an abolitionist to, to the core and, and very open about it. So um, I don't want us to miss these sort of moral aspects as well. Um, notice that he was born, in, as I said, in 335 and died 394 or 395. Um, historians debate over this up just a bit. And um, notice, though, where that puts us. So he's born 10 years after the council, the famous Council of Nicaea. So he's obviously not a party to that. He's not a, a, a force in that. He's not a player in that. He's not even born yet, much less you know, able to be active and influential. So his work really comes, his influence comes in the, the latter part of the fourth century. And um, he dies in 395, which of course is a little over a decade after the famous uh, council at Constantinople. What we often refer to as the Nicene Creed, um, on those days that we still use the creed in our churches, which maybe aren't quite enough, but you know, uh, on the days that we actually use the creed, what we refer to as the Nicene Creed is not actually from, from Nicaea in 325. It's the Niceno-Constantinopolitan formula of 381, uh, which is a whole lot clumsier to say, so we just go with Nicene. Um, there are actually some important differences of, in the wording, and there's a claimed continuity of uh, trajectory of thought, but, the, but some of the uh, statements, both positively and negatively, both the affirmations and the anathemas, um, do, do change. We'll talk about that um, now, because let's move to a um, discussion of the context a bit. So I'm going to attempt a, a screen share and hopefully, um, I'm checking with you, David, can you, can you see this? All right. So sometimes we look at this like the, the fourth century is this, just this crazy confusing place. Uh, and it is a strange place, but sometimes we look at it like this crazy, confusing place, and then sometimes we tend to uh, oversimplify the history a bit. And the oversimplified history kind of goes like this. There were the bad guys, the Aryans, and Athanasius whacked them, and the church pretty much emerged triumphant. There were some semi-Aryans that popped onto the scene. They were dealt with. Everything was reaffirmed neatly and nicely in 381, and that's the story. So you get the, the bad guys, the Aryans, the kind of bad guys, the semi-Aryans, and then, of course, the Orthodox, who are sort of maintained the same thing the whole way through. The actual history is a lot more complicated, and um, I'm not a specialist in patristic theology. Maybe I should have said that, made that disclaimer earlier. Um, or maybe I should have waited until we're done so you guys don't tune off. Um, I do, I am a systematic theologian who specializes in work in Trinity and Christology. So I end up spending a lot of my life in the fourth century, um, but also try to learn from medieval theologians and early modern theology and, 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 and biblical theology. Um, but there are people who do specialize in the fourth century. And they live their entire lives in the fourth century. And they give us, uh, in some cases, some really, really helpful works. In Q&A, if you want uh, some references, I'll be happy to share some of those. Um, but there are people who do specialize. This is really just some of them. This is all they do. And they have helpfully, I think, illuminated some of the areas of, of controversy that go beyond this sort of easy history. So this is a, um, if you see on the handout here, this is a, a still very abbreviated timeline. Believe it or not, it is a very abbreviated timeline of some of the councils. But it is um, a, a, it goes a lot further than just the Nicaea to Constantinople, 325, 381, done. Now, so you see here, there are some that are um, more important and historically have stood out. So famously Nicaea, 325. But notice Antioch by 341, Sertica, 343, 
There's the first Sirmian Creed at 351, Arlay 353, Milan 355. There are multiple councils that meet at Nice, um, and no one's exactly sure why, but some people have speculated it may be just because it sounds like Nicaea. All right, here's the interesting thing about these councils. Some of them are echoing a lot of what was said at Nicaea. Some of them are flat out rejecting Nicaea. And there's no other way to read them. Others are, I think, rejecting some of what was done at our, the, the important parts of Nicaea, but not taking it on directly. Instead, you know, looking for a kind of third way. And so, um, some of these, uh, one of them famously, it's got a great name, it's called the Macro Stitch, which is the Long Line Creed. Uh, so if you think the, the Nicene Creed you recite in church is long and clumsy, just check this one out sometime. It's the king of run-on sentences, um, just stitched together and something in there to make everyone happy. So the Macro Stitch uh, Creed. Uh, the main ones for our purposes are still, of course, uh, 325 and, and 381. The, the heresies, uh, these are the controversies. And there were, of course, some that were inherited by this point. Famously, modalism, or sometimes called civilianism, uh, sometimes called praxianism. I know you've read Tertullius, er, Tertullian earlier, and his against Praxius is targeting this sort of view. Um, this is just the view that basically um, there are three different modes or aspects to the one God. Uh, often sequentially ordered shows up as this, and then as this, and then as that. Um, I have a um, went to church for a while when we lived in Wisconsin with a, a wonderful family and uh, a really cool guy. Art, we I pick my boys up from um, Sunday school, and he would pick his beautiful little girls up at the same time, and we would chat and. One day, um, I found out that he had played football for the Ohio State Buckeyes, then the Chicago Bears, and then the Philadelphia Eagles. And he played different positions and, of course, wore different jerseys. Still Damon Moore. Playing different roles, but the same dude. Here's the thing. Of course, if Damon the... Um, football player gets hurt, um, every other aspect of Damon's life suffers as well. Um, that's modalism. Ruled out early on decisively, but it is in the background. And it's partly in the background because no one wants to be a modalist or civilian at this point. Um, you know, we, we've all learned the lesson by this point in the fourth century. That's not, a, that's not an acceptable view. So we're going to need to steer clear of that. Of course, docetism um, has often gone with it and is, um, sorry, adoptionism has often gone with it. But a docetism is the view that um, the, the incarnate son, or who, the one we think is the incarnate son, um, is not actually incarnate, but is only apparently human. So he appears to be or seems to be human. So he's, he can be fully divine. You can have all of that but not the full humanity. This, again, has been dealt with pretty swiftly and fairly decisively early on. The mirror uh, problem with that is adoptionism, which is to deny the divinity of the man Jesus Christ. So he's a wonderful guy, maybe one of the greatest teachers for some, clearly the very best teacher, uh, especially adopted by God, and the debates will break out and the theories will vary, either at the baptism, where the voice comes, this is my beloved son, maybe at his resurrection, the seal of approval, maybe his ascension, but somewhere along the way, God adopts him as the special one. All right, those are the background heresies. 3, circa 318, so this again is about a decade and a half before Gregory's even born. But this is still very much part of his context. Arius, um, a presbyter from Alexandria, is concerned, and apparently a, apparently a fabulously gifted preacher, is concerned that he hears his 
his um his main preacher um alexander of alexandria yes they needed more names to go around back then um but he is uh concerned that what he's hearing so strongly stresses the unity or oneness of the son of the father that he says i can't really tell this apart from the modalism or sabellianism that we all know is wrong right so um Probably, by the way, in an effort to make doctrine easy and accessible. Probably not in an effort to ruin the gospel, okay? Probably not for all the bad reasons, but probably to make evangelism and discipleship so-called easier. Arius says, I've got an easier solution. And it goes roughly like this. Here are the main premises of this view. And if you want more on this, I especially recommend R.P.C. Hansen's book, The Search for the Christian Doctrine of God. Um, it's about 900 pages just on this controversy. It's thorough. Um, but these points you can all find there. So here's Arius is kind of Arianism. God was not always Father. Once just God, who then became Father. The Logos, or Son, is a creature, a creature made, like the rest of us, out of nothing. Well, this means, then, that there are at least, at least two uh, Logoi within God, and at least two or several powers of divinity. There is the Logos that's a creature, but there's also God's rationality, whereby the high God uh, made them. So there's at least two. The Son is variable by nature and remains pure and holy only by grace, much like humans do, much like the rest of humans can. The Son is alien from the divine being. He can be called, this is the tricky part, can he, if you ask, can he be called God? Oh, of course we believe he's God. But he's not true God because he's come into existence. He's been brought into existence by the high God. So the Son, as a creature, is has knowledge of God that is better than ours, but imperfect. The Son has been a, the first, the first and highest cre, uh, creature, who then is the instrument of the rest of creation. So it's God, the high God, creates a divine being the Son, who then is the instrument of the rest of creation, who then becomes human and incarnate within that creation. This has got all the features of, you know, easy answers to every question. You've got a high God, and then you've got this created deity, who, who is the instrument of the rest of creation, who then becomes incarnate for us and our salvation. Clearly, he's above us, and there's a sense in which he not only can, but should be called divine. This is not just adoptionism, okay? Um, this is not that view. He is divine. But he's subordinate to the Father, and in his being or essence, he's ontologically subordinate to the Father. This is Arius's, this is in a nutshell, this is this is Arius's view. It becomes widely, one might say, wildly popular. And at some point, when the Emperor Constantine breaks up the empire uh, among his kids, the kids apparently like it a lot too and, and go for it. That's why, by the way, in the mid-fourth century, some of the pro-Nicene people are being chased um, into uh, into exile, uh, some of them multiple times, Athanasius five. Um, this this takes off, and I I think it's important to at least understand something of the the attractional pull of it. Here's here's Arius trying to say, I want a view that's understandable, that's accessible, that we can get. And I want a view that handles the data of Scripture. So, 
if you ask Arius on his view, does the sun pre-exist all of creation? Sure. So all the passages that talk about the, you know, the pre-existence of the sun. Yeah, absolutely. Because he pre-exists all the other created things. Is he, in fact, he'll say Colossians 1, 15 through 20 is just a good proof text. He's the firstborn of all creation. So they, he says, see, this view can handle those passages which ascribe something radically different to the sun. But they, he says, my view can also handle all of the passages which talk about the uh, uh, subordination of the sun, the weakness of the sun, the fear of the sun, the ignorance of the sun, um, the hesitations of the sun. So he says, uh, they love this. The Father is greater than I. See, Jesus said it himself. You going to disagree with Jesus? Jesus uh, asked, uh, who touched me? Really? You guys, you pro-Nicene crowd, you want to say that, you know, um, Jesus is God. Well, God's omniscient. He not, God's not needing to be asking, you know, who touched him. Jesus says, no one knows Mark 13, 32. No one knows the day or the hour, not even the Son of Man. All these are gotcha verses for him. All the passages that talk about the weakness of the Son, this, the ignorance of the Son, um, the subordination of the Son. The Arians latch onto those, and that's, I think, a big part of what makes this view so attractive. By the way, if just so we are reminded this is not just a history lesson, um, there are recent polls that have come out that show that there is a disturbing, to me, very disturbing uh, percentage of North American evangelical Christians who hold something pretty much like this still today. And um, it's, it's, it, it's the one that, I said modalism and some of these others have, have largely gone away. I mean, they're still around in some aspect or some form, but they don't have the same sort of gravitational pull. Arianism is just really, um, is just really intuitive and can make sense of all these biblical passages. And it also ends up making a kind of doctrine of salvation that at least initially sounds really promising. It pretty much goes like this. Jesus is limited, and yet he lives a perfect life. You have limitations. You too can live that kind of life. He sets a great example. You should follow in it. Again, I say that sounds great to people because I think a lot of a lot of people, you know, in the pews, we like to be told, we like to be told we're great and can do great things. We like rousing speeches in our in, in place of sermons that tell you how great you are and all the things you can accomplish. It sounds great at first until you actually try to do it. And then you realize that we don't need, um, as Dennis Kenlaw says, we don't need another chance. We need a radical change. All right, so anyway, that's the theology of early Arianism. And as is well known, Council of Nicaea has convened to address this controversy. Um, the Nicene Creed, the, the, the original one plus the one we say, has and has retained the word homoousios, um, of one being or of one essence, and gets translated into Latin, uh, uno substantia, so of one substance. And this is one of the pieces, the main one, but one of the ones that the Arians just can't handle. Now, it also becomes a flashpoint, and the term homoousios becomes actually really controversial itself. Here's one of the reasons it becomes controversial. It actually has a checkered past. It's been used by Gnostics uh, in, in the more distant past. So, you're, you know, I know earlier in, the, in this uh, session, you've read Irenaeus um, and his works against the Gnostics. Well, the Gnostics actually, uh, apparently, in, in at least a few places, like the term homoousios. They use it very differently, but it still kind of has a, has a bad ring to it. Here's the big problem. Where's that in the Bible? It's not there. 
you're not going to get any concordance that shows you the word homoousios. And so the critics push back saying, wait a second, you're saying that to believe the Bible, we have to affirm a word that's not a Bible word. And the pronouncings are basically, yep, that's right. Because this one word pulls together all of these other elements. Well, this debate over the term homoousios and the bigger theological debates around it keep going. And so by mid-fourth century, okay, and so now we're closing in on the Cappadocians, right, time-wise. We get what is sometimes called a kind of Arianism. It's just sometimes called Homoian theology as well. Notice I said homoousios a moment ago. Uh, compound word, homoousios, one essence or one uh, being uh, together. Well, some of these, I mentioned earlier, some of these creeds, some of these mid-fourth century creeds, Antioch, Sertica, the First Sermian Creed, etc. Some of these are direct alternatives that are saying, some of them are explicitly, explicitly state, quote, unquote, make no mention of Usia. It's a philosophical term. We don't want it. And so what they say is, we're just going to stick with the Bible language. And so these creeds tend to have a lot of Bible quotations. And these mid-fourth century creeds will say, we're not interested in the philosophical speculation. We don't need words like usia and hypostasis. We're just going with what the Bible teaches. Oh, and it turns out what the Bible teaches is a ranked hierarchy, the Father always above the Son. You still get the same kind of subordinationism. So again, this is a, a quick summary of Homoian theology. The Father is in, incomparably greater. Again, the Son created by the will of God, subordinated to the Father. And so to the extent you have a trinity, you have a trinity of different beings who are ranked. So the Homoian uh, group were tended to be, if I could put it this way, probably well-intentioned, very sincere biblicist. Um, theologians. By the time of the Cappadocians, some of their major conversation partners and debate partners uh, are the Neo-Aryans. And again, that's not, maybe not the best term. Sometimes just called the Eunomians after Eunomius. A, a big, big chunk of Gregory of Nyssa's extant writings are called Contra Eunomius. They are directly in response to Eunomius. And Eunomius is not the pious, um, simple-minded, stick-with-the-Bible-verses kind of guy. The Eunomians are very philosophical, raise intensely philosophical um, um, considerations, make sharply logical debates, and Gregory answers them on those terms. He really does. Uh, here's here's the, one of the main sort of core arguments of the Eunomians, or the Neo-Aryans, if you, if you prefer. They think names reveal the essence of things. That is, God, at least theoretically, can be known comprehensively or exhaustively. In fact, we know enough about God to know this, that to be ingenerate is the very definition of deity. But, of course, we know that the Son is generated, comes from the Father. And this is the gotcha moment, man. This is where the, tr the logical trap snaps shut. The Son, therefore, is heterousios, of a different essence, other essence. And, of course, is radically subordinate to the Father. So where the Homoians of the mid-fourth century are usually this sort of... Um, probably very sincere, um, less clearly much less sophisticated intellectually, and more directly biblicist in their approach. Um, the Eunomians are really philosophical. They like the philosophical language, thus they end up with terms like heterousios. Um, these are some of these sort of main arguments. And as I've said, what all of these have in common, uh, both the Homoian arguments, the older Aryan arguments, and the Neo-Aryan arguments against which the Cappadocians are, are, are arguing 
love the texts which speak of the ignorance of Jesus, the fear of, we, of Jesus, the weakness of Jesus. They love all the passages where Jesus says, the Father is greater than I. I've only come to do the will of the Father. You know, I'm just here, I'm just here to do what he said. Um, and, and they make these sort of arguments um, sometimes repeatedly, forcefully, rhetorically, in, in powerful ways. And they, they deserve a response. Much of what uh, Gregor of Nyssa does is actually in response to the Eunomians or neo arians the latter category. One group I didn't mention on the handout, but does deserve um, obvious mention. And I, I apologize for this, but there's just no other way to do it. Remember Nicaea, homoousios, of one essence. One essence, one being. Remember the one of the Aryan groups, we don't like that language, so let's just say they're homoian. Jesus is like the Father, and of course subordinate. And then there are the uh, Eunomian or Neo Aryans that are heterousios, which is of a different substance, radically different. There are also the homoousions, which develop, and sometimes they've been called semi Aryans. But I think uh, more recent scholarship has, has not looked favorably on that term. And has basically looked at them as people who are trying to affirm the Nicene view, but still have adequate categories, right? Still have adequate categories to talk about how the Father and Son are distinct, or Father, Son, and Spirit are distinct. If all you affirm is homoousios of one, essence or being, and you don't have corresponding language to talk about how they're distinct, it looks like the worry is you're going to fall back into the older view of modalism or civilianism. Now, here's where the important difference, or and a really important difference between Nicaea 325 and Constantinople 381 come into, into view. 325 says yes to homoousios, and then denies that there are three hypostases. It says one usia and one hypostasis, because in 325, those are synonymous terms. By the time you get to 381, 382, you get one usia and three hypostases. That's what you get for a half century of theological debate. Um, that's what you get when the Cappadocians are doing their work. That's what you get when um, Athanasius is doing his work, and I, um, I mean, we don't have the we don't have the the counts of the councils and who voted which, right? We just don't have that stuff. Uh, we have a lot of records, we don't have that. But what seems plausible to a lot of historians, and it does to me as well, is that one of the things that really shifted um, the debate was when the homoousians became convinced that you could say homoousios with no problem as long as we are also able to affirm uh, three hypostases for three persons. So you can have one being or essence as long as you also have three persons. And by the time you get to 381, that's exactly, or 382, that's exactly what we get. All right, I'm gonna move a little bit more quickly just because I'm watching the time. Um, a lot of these debates are over exegesis. And obviously they are, and obviously they should be. And so the anti-Aryans of uh, the Cappadocians, also Athanasius, and um, a whole bunch of others, uh, Basil of Ankara would, would be another. Um, they are arguing on the, in the West, Hilary of Poitiers is doing similar sorts of arguments. They're arguing from, from exegesis of scripture, both for the humanity of Christ, but also for the deity of Christ the full deity of Christ, and they do so in several ways. And I've just, if you look at the handout, this is a quick summary. Um, I actually spent several months, uh, actually a big chunk of time, um, while I was dissertating uh, way back in the day, uh, just reading major fourth century um, theologians and compiling. So this list right here is almost entirely um, from fourth century pro-Nicene the theologians. This is the way they argued. And, and of course, this is just a really brief summary. But these are some of the passages to which they appealed and the very categories that many of them used. Um, this, this is drawn from them. 
Um, and so you can see these exegetical arguments, both for the humanity of Christ, they were not willing to give that up, also for the deity of Christ. And so what they argued was basically, no, there's not one Trinity proof text. There, there isn't. What there is instead, and here's where recent work by like people like Fred Sanders is great. I know Fred's been on your, on your program. It's not that there's just one Trinity verse. What we have instead is the teaching woven throughout the whole of the New Testament in ways that take passages from the Old Testament, the strongest statements of monotheism in the Old Testament, and include Jesus and the Holy Spirit within that monotheism in the New. It's amazing. Deuteronomy 6, 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. When Paul writes his first letter to the Corinthians, comes to uh, chapter 8, which we read as, as obviously, is the famous text about um, meat offered to idols. But you look in there, and you've got to look kind of close because Paul is quoting the Greek uh, Old Testament. But what he's doing is he's reciting Deuteronomy 6, 4, and including Jesus within that. It's, just, it's stunning. Philippians 2. Jesus, or Paul there quotes Isaiah 45, 23. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. That's Isaiah 45. Paul says, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Kyrios or Lord. But not to, the, not to be confused, to the glory of his Father. So you can see then the way that the um, New Testament authors never reject the Old Testament, never reject the monotheism of the Old Testament. But what they do is they expand our understanding of it in light of the Christ event, in light of incarnation, in light of Christmas and, and Christmas and Easter. All right, there's a really brief summary of this. I mentioned as well that um, most, of the, most of the attention was on the uh, exegetical arguments, but I'm going to mention three others really quickly because these were also widespread. Um, the doxological argument, only God is rightly worshipped. Any monotheist knows that. Jesus Christ is rightly worshipped. And here's the argument. Everywhere in the Christian churches, it doesn't matter if we speak Coptic or if we speak Latin or if we speak Aramaic or if we speak um, uh, Greek, it doesn't matter what part of the world we're in. Of course, everyone knows that Jesus Christ is to be worshipped. Therefore, Jesus Christ is God. And closely related to it, probably even more um, pointed is the salvation argument. Only God can save. Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world. Therefore, there's just no other ways to put it. Jesus Christ is God. And um, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention as well that um, this is my term, it's clumsy, but what I call the monotheism argument is always at work too. Basically, it goes like this. If you're an Aryan and you've got the high God, the hidden God that's behind it all, you know, the, the, the really high one, and then you've got Jesus, who's not just another human, he's also divine, but he's beneath. Well, how many gods do you have? You have at least two. Depending on what you do with the Holy Spirit, you might have three. But that's at least one too many. And, and I'm serious. This is a major kind of argument. So um, anyway, all right. We could go a lot further. I won't now. Um, let me just say something in the last three or four minutes about um, his theological, um, just a quick summary of some of the major points. Theological method. You've already seen this if you're reading some Gregory, um, but I'll just confirm it. He's interesting. A lot of the pieces are occasional. So you're sometimes left in the dark as to who's he talking to, right? What's, what's going on behind this? And in some cases, further research will help us. In some cases, not as much as we hope. He's interesting. Part of why he's interesting, he, sometimes he's really rhetorically flourishing and uh, almost poetic. In other places, you can see this guy who's really schooled in logic, really careful in metaphysics, and it looks really philosophical. He doesn't 
right in one way. Some of it sounds like he's preaching with a lot of passion. And some of it sounds like, you know, he's really burrowed down in logic bill. And, and, and he is, I mean, he knows what he's doing. He can be all over the place, but he wants to do theology in response to revelation, which he takes to be both what to use later terms, both kind of general or natural, but also ultimately God revealed in Christ. Um, God for him, who is God? Well, Gregor Nazianzus has this great line. When I say God, I mean Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And I think that um, you could say that about his buddy, Gregor Nisset, too. Uh, when he's talking about God, it's not like he's got another concept of God, and then if someone brings up the Trinity, he's like, oh, yeah, we'll do that, too. Um, this is just woven throughout um, his, his theology. It just is his theology. But I also want to mention, he also has a really strong doctrine, a really powerful doctrine of divine simplicity. And so if you read like the, um, if we had time, look at the, you know, the, um, the catechetical oration or great catechism. Um, it, it, it's there. You, once you see it, you can't unsee it. And it's really all over the place. Um, so he has both a strong account of divine oneness or unity and, uh, sim and even simplicity and um, robustly Trinitarian all the way down. It's interesting to me, he, he, his, he, his doctrine of creation is not necessary for God. It's a free act, but it's not a random act. It's a free act motivated by love. He emphasizes, therefore, then the goodness of creation, because God is simple. God is goodness itself. It's not necessary that God create, but it's necessary that anything that God does is motivated by goodness. might sound con contradictory. I don't think it is, but he does have both sides of that. God doesn't have to do cr this creation stuff, but any, any creation stuff God does is always going to be motivated by good. It's to share God's own goodness. Therefore, the creation is to be seen as good, it's to be affirmed as that. And that's why we're to hate evil, by the way, because it's this destroyer that comes in and ruins what is good. And he has a account of the free will defense that goes with that. Um, not, not that he's unique at all in that. Um, you've seen him on incarnation and atonement. This is not a sort of classic sort of penal substitution view. Um, it's a little more complicated than that and probably not as developed as some other accounts of atonement, just to be honest. Um, probably leaves more questions hanging. His doctrine of salvation. Um, I'll leave several parts. I just I'll close with this. For him, we are created for nothing less. And for him, all humans are created for nothing less than to know and enjoy the goodness of God. Getting out of hell is like not really the point for him. I mean, it's a big deal, but it's not like the thing. It's not the ultimate thing. Salvation is not an escape thing. We're not just saved from for him. The bigger concept is we are saved for, for the simple, utter, ultimate goodness of God. And that means that he believes in perfection, Christian perfection. And here's the interesting thing. Perfection for him is not getting to the ceiling of moral life and stopping there. Because for him, there is no such thing. Perfection for him is infinite growth into godliness. Which, by the way, at least, at least according to what he says in the life of Moses, uh, his treatise, The Life of Moses, will continue through all eternity. As God's goodness is infinite, so no finite creature is ever going to exhaust that. So however long eternity lasts, we're never going to exhaust God's goodness. And we will be made more and more and more like God throughout that. So it is a definitely a doctrine of Christian perfection. It is definitely not um, a sort of static, 
um, it can't could never be reduced to um, you made a certain number of trips to an altar, and from that point you could never get any better, and you better not get any worse. That's not the point for him. All right, I've gone too long. Um, I I wasn't really paying attention to the clock, so let me. Yeah, no problem. That's great. Yeah, very good. Um, and we certainly have more questions than what we uh, would ever have time in a single recording to get to. Um, so I want to make sure that Jonathan uh, is able to get some questions in as well. Uh, so Jonathan, if you want to um, type those out or send those, and uh, we'll kind of bounce back and forth here. Um, could, I, could I just ask yeah. a question about the just the, the approach since I took way too long. Um, if we could do another session, could mm -hmm. we just start with those then? Yeah, sure, sure. So we hope to, obviously we're spending three months on the Cappadocians. So, uh, and we, um, you know, we hope to have at least two uh, recordings on, on the Cappadocians. Sure. So uh, we definitely will continue the conversation, um, you know, in another month or so. Uh, so for those who uh, are following along in our reading, um, and, and by the way, we have several who are not part of the group who are also watching, and maybe they're doing some reading too. I don't know, but they're they're tuning in as well to to uh, learn and to, to grow. So uh, first of all, I I love that um, in the biographical. Uh, introduction there that uh, you mentioned that these men are um, well they're bishops so they are they're ministering they're preaching in in local churches they are ministering meeting uh, the, the social uh, community needs as well they're they're urging the followers to to do that. Um, so, so let's just let's start there with their pastoral social concern, and connecting that to these, uh, to, particularly to to Arianism, but these heresies that they're dealing with, and they can very quickly become very philosophical. Um, can, can you just talk about the the most immediate pastoral concerns here that are driving? the depth of their engagement. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm going to quote someone who's, um, to, to set, to get into this, I'll, I'll offer a, a quote mm -hmm. from someone who is a recently deceased theologian, but who, um, lived, lived in this fourth century milieu for, for decades. And that's Thomas F. Torrance. Mm -hmm. And he's got this, this great line. It's in the beginning. He has a book called The Trinitarian Faith. It's subtitled The Evangelical Catholic Theology, or the, uh, Ev Evangelical Theology of the Ancient Catholic Church. Mm. Um, and his preface in there offers, I think, a really nice summary response to the question you just asked, David. Mm. And he says, cut the bond of being between Jesus Christ and God. And the gospel message becomes an empty mockery. And then he, he sort of further explains it like this. He says, if what Jesus did in pronouncing forgiveness of sins hmm. is not actually what God says about our sins, hmm. sure. it has no ultimate validity and it offers us no sure hope. In other words, if he's just on our side, say he's fully human, right? And he's on our side of our problems. Well, we may have a, a fellow sympathizer. You know, we've got somebody over here with us. But does he make atonement? Mm -hmm. Does he make at one minute? If he's just on our side, he might be a role model. He might be a friend. But he's not a savior. On the other hand, if he's, if he's truly divine, but not really and truly fully human, then as Torrent, when well, he's got this phrase where he says, the love of God has not come 
has not finally come to be all the way with us. Mm. Yeah. It means it, it means it came close. Maybe close enough to, to taunt us or tease us. Mm -hmm. But if he's fully divine, then what he says is what God says. Yeah. When he says, you belong to me, when he says, I no, call you, no longer call you servants, but friends. Mm -hmm. When he says, it is finished. Yeah. It's God's final word. Yeah. So that's why, the, that's why these debates, you're entirely right. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they sound philosophical. Sometimes yeah. they are philosophical. I mean, there's just no other way around it. I mean, the Eunomians are yeah. philosophers. And when Gregory is responding to the Eunomians, he's got his philosophical hat on and his philosophical boots on and mm -hmm. his philosophical gloves on. I mean, that's what he's doing. Mm -hmm. but, it, but it's easy to lose sight of the fact of like, why were they doing this? Yeah. Yeah. Athanasius is not exiled those times because he was wanting to tenure somewhere. Mm -hmm. Right. Or wanting to be like, I'll think up a really hard problem. And then I'll solve it in front of my church and they'll think I'm smart. Like that's not what he's doing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For, for all of these people, they're like the gospel is at stake here. Yeah. Because if he's, if Jesus Christ is really divine, then what he says is what God says. What he does is what God does. And if he's really and fully and completely human, then if we are united with him, right? Paul, the Pauline mm -hmm. language about union with Christ. If we're united with him, then we are reconciled to God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's not just in a legal sense, although legal is part of it, right? It's not just yeah. that. It's in a ontological sense. It's in a personal sense. Yeah. So thanks for the question. I, maybe I said too much, yeah. but that, that's what I'm getting yeah, that's, yeah, well, that's incredibly helpful. And I think actually... And, and just in your answer there, um, it it captures, I think, the the beauty and the simplicity of that truth and and puts it really even in pastoral and preaching language that pastors can can latch on to. But there's an interesting phenomenon that that happens, especially in America, where we have just, you know, a complex of, you know, church traditions and Christianities. So this, this, uh, th this kind of generic idea that it doesn't matter what that church or what, you know, my friend who is a Christian believes about the Trinity or even maybe about the divinity of Christ there, they are, uh, you know, there are good moral people who are adhering to, you know, the teachings of Christ and that sort of thing. And, but there's, there's this, I, I think people overlook the, the phenomenon of, of, of the disconnect, the connection you've made, but how people disconnect that and in their own minds, they, they may not, but at very least over time, that, that wedge, that chasm gets larger and larger and larger until people really don't know why they believe in Jesus Christ. Right. And so this is, um, th so these, these men that we're talking about are, are seeing that happen in their lifetime and even before. And if we don't see that now and articulate clearly why the Trinity, why, why is it when we say God, we mean we are saying father, son, and Holy spirit and why that's so important, uh, then that, that will happen. And I think does happen as people reject in local church, reject philosophical theology and say, well, keep that at the academy. Don't let that come into the local church. We just want to hear what we need to do. Right. All right. So we can talk about that for a long time. Um, uh, Jonathan, let me give you an opportunity. Sure. Thanks so much, Dr. McCall. I uh, really enjoyed that. So, a lot of questions, but one that uh, especially interested in is your comments about uh, how Gregory of Nyssa and the Cappadocians contrast this kind of like bare biblicism. Um, 
I've just started to explore like partitive and prosopological exegesis. And what interests me in that is just how beautiful it is in the writings of the Cappadocians. Like there's some passages in Gregory of Nazianzus that are just, just beautiful. Uh, The humanity and the deity of Christ, you know, expressed in his life. Um, Could you just explain those a little bit and comment on how they can be pastorally helpful, especially in in preaching and teaching through the Gospels, uh, and how they can help us to navigate some of those thorny texts that we come across as preachers and teachers? Yeah, so uh, two two phrases there. Um, Part of exegesis, um, that may sound like an overly technical term, but basically it goes back all the way it goes back to these controversies, if not before. So, as I said earlier, the Arians, the different types of Arians, they love the, I mean, they could, they love, a set, you know, they love some verses and pull some out and be like, oh yeah, um, see, look, he says, I don't know the day or the hour. And that they're like, gotcha, right? And Jesus says, I'm, Father's way above me, man. What, I mean, you know, like, and they're like, see? So they love those. Well, when you're in exegetical debate, um, the, the quick list I gave were of positive arguments. But they also, and those are really important, but the pro nicenes also had to have something to say about the Aryan arguments. In other words, they had to play defense too. And so they, the way they would do it would be with what's called now part of the exegesis. And the basic rule of it is, is that the, those texts which speak to the weakness or humanity or ignorance or submission or subordination of the Son are to be understood, so thus attributed to or predicated of the Son, for sure, but the Son according to his human nature. And this is all over this literature, uh, some version or other of this. This is a standard exegetical move. There's nothing unique about the Cappadocians on this, uh, my, for my view, thankfully. I mean, this is just this is just sort of a standard move. You see it Latin, the Latins and the Greeks. It's it's pretty much all over the place. Um, let me. Uh, I'm going to keep this really quick, but I'll just go back to screen share just for a moment, because um, as is often the case, it's not. I mean, the patristics do things really well in many cases, but sometimes the medieval theologians really sort of tighten it up. So let me just go down to, uh, this is a statement from Thomas Aquinas. Uh, if you can see this here under um, quadlibital question 16.5, right? Um, and 16.8 and 20.1. So here's the question. And again, sorry if it sounds technical, but we're, this is the part of exegesis stuff at work. Um, is it right to say that, is it true to say that Christ is a creature? And that's what the Arian said, right? And he responds by saying, we must not say absolutely that he's a creature, but with a qualification. That is, with respect to his human nature. The human nature is created. The person isn't. The human nature he takes upon himself is. And that's part of exegesis at work. And he used that principle all over the place in, in, with respect to these passages. Um, now, he has a particular way of doing it where it comes out, um, well, I'll leave that. I'll leave the particular way now. Um, other medievals do it slightly differently or significantly differently. Uh, but that's still the basic kind of move that's being made. Um, and I think without that, we're really hard-pressed to read Scripture as any kind of coherent whole. If you don't have something like that, um, any, any unity of Scripture is just going to be lost. Yeah, uh, at, least, at least so far as I can see. Yeah, that that actually goes right into the the question I had um, as well. That is, you talked about the you know the Arians, some Arians saying you know hey we're just we're we're just going to use scripture right you know that's kind yep. of a biblicist approach, and so uh, you just really answered the question in regard to understanding sufficiency and unity of scripture right? That we need words to help us uh, to, to, to understand the unity of scripture, to have a sufficient understanding of the unity of scripture, right? 
uh, you know, that, that's a big thing in, in um, you know, more uh, conservative tradition, evangelical traditions where there's just a disparaging of using something outside of, you know, the, you got to have book chapter verse for every word that you use. Um, you know, I, I, even in preaching, I've had people say, you know, why'd you use this word? It's not in the Bible, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, you have any further comments on that? So, yeah, I mean, these are, these are really important even for thinking about, you know, how do, how do we preach? And here's, here are just two quick points, okay? Mm-hmm. And one of them is, is that I don't think we can overstress, maybe we can, I just don't think many people I know are in danger of it. The, the overarching unity of scripture. Mm-hmm. Yes. And, and I, I say that, um, you know, I was talking to a 19 year old not lot long ago. And I happen to know this, this, um, this young person was, is a devout person, right? Very, very serious in his faith and loves the Lord and goes away to college and, and comes home with, um, lots of questions and it starts to look like the Bible is this wild um, just compilation of very different things right I mean there's I mean what is the Old Testament law you know these legal this legal code have to do with the teachings of Jesus right at first glance it, with Paul right just there's just so much going on. Now, this, this person, I happen to know what church he had gone to, at least some of his life. And I know it was a really Bible-believing, sort, kind of conservative evangelical church. And, and would take months sometimes to preach through Galatians. You know, just plowing through. And then months to preach through Micah. Right? And good. All good. But what, and, and in some ways, the preaching was sort of um, exemplary of evangelical expository preaching that centers in on one passage, right, and does it right. But what he didn't have, this, this person didn't have, was a sense of how it fits together at all. And I know in some evangelical Bible college and seminaries, people are warned not to go big picture too much. I'm just saying pastorally, I don't think we're doing it enough. Yeah. And think, and then think about further the entire non-Christian culture, when it pays any attention to the Bible, looks at it like it's this wild, you know, collection of some myth and some kind of cool teaching. And right, there's no assumption there of the unity of scripture. Yeah, And so I just don't think we can overdo that, or at least I don't think we're in much danger of overdoing that these days. Sure. And this is this older type of part of exegesis and prosolog- prosological uh, exegesis, whereby we're reading scripture as a whole. The, new, the Old Testament is pointing forward to Christ. Mm-hmm. The gospel centers on Christ. <clears throat> the latter New Testament unpacks what that means. It's all focused on the Christ the Father, He reveals the Spirit they send. That's all of it, all the time. Mm-hmm. And to focus on any, even if you take it as true, which hopefully you do, uh, but if you focus on anything other than God's action in Christ and the Spirit for the sake of the world, we're losing something. And, and believe me, it is getting lost. I mean, I hear it, yeah. you know? So that's yeah. the first point. Mm-hmm. Sorry. The second one, yeah, I'll be quicker. That's good. that's good. Is on some of this like Trinity and Christology stuff. Uh, I'll share something that from something on the doctrine of sin, uh, but it's a parallel. So in the late 16th century, the Lutherans had this big internal debate over the doctrine of sin. Is sin a substance or what? Like, how exactly do you think of it? And they had a big debate, and they came out with a big count conciliar statement, and it's very definitive, and they're like, no, sin is not a substance, and please don't ever, ever, ever say that. And here are reasons why right? Their arguments. I won't get into that. What I do want to focus on is they have this really, I think, really helpful, pastorally sensitive exhortation at the end of this whole debate. 
And the exhortation goes like this. It says, do not use these technical philosophical terms from the pulpit. Now, it's a bit different there than with the creeds, because the creeds, I mean, they're actually in the creeds. Mm -hmm. um, this debate wasn't. They said, uh, but anyway, the, the conclusion of this debate has this pastoral done that says, don't burden people who don't have that kind of education with this, mm -hmm. where they either feel inferior or because they don't get it or think they do get it and then think they're pompous or something, right? Mm -hmm. They said, don't use this language, but have a clear understanding so that the things you do preach don't run into the errors we're talking about. Mm -hmm. So then it's incumbent upon the, the preachers not to use the technical language all the time in their sermons, but to be clear enough about it so that when they do preach, that they can preach with clarity and power and force without going the wrong way either direction. Does that, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, certainly. Certainly. I, I think that, you know, like, um, I'm not saying there's never a place in a congregational pastoral sermon to talk about why homoousios is the right word and heterousios is wrong. I think mm -hmm. that could be done, but that's probably not going to be bread and butter, right? Mm -hmm. Sure. But sure. what you are going to do, I hope, is preach Jesus. Yeah. And, and what you want to say about Jesus every time you preach about Jesus is not compromising either the humanity or the deity of Christ mm -hmm. or the oneness of person, right? That you're clear enough about that, that that hangs together. Mm -hmm. That when you're talking about the work of Christ on our behalf, it's not divorced from the work of the father on our behalf, right? As if there's different things going on. There's one operation, right? There's one divine plan. There's one divine act. And when we think of the Holy spirit, it's not like this other thing that, you know, is sort of an extra but this is the spirit sent by Christ to fulfill the work, right? So there's this unity that flows through. So every time we do talk about the Holy Spirit, when we do preach about Christ, we're not, we're not pushing the wrong direction or saying the wrong things. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's helpful. And I think one way we can keep, uh, you're talking about uh, you know, preaching, you know, expository preaching, looking at the minutia, but one way I think in the, in our worship services, we can keep that connected to the big picture is by returning to the sacrament and by at least occasionally reciting the creed yeah. and bringing in those big picture uh, uh, elements back to our worship service instead of singing a few, you know, songs, maybe hymn, and then, you know, hour of expository preaching. Uh, yeah, I think that's one thing that the pastors uh, we we lose a lot when we lose those uh, you lose the uh, the sacrament of the Lord's table and Nicene Creed for sure, right? You've we, probably all heard this, but I'll just mention it um, anyway. Um, the old cliche um, about about Anglican worship that you're going to hear the gospel even if the sermon is horrible. No, <laughs> right. right? Exactly. Yeah. 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 Because yeah. every every yeah every service it's built into the into the rhythm and the, yeah. the fabric of the church yeah mm -hmm. yeah it's good good okay uh well i'll tell you what we're gonna we're gonna pick this up again uh we we still have gregory venantiansis there's a lot to to discuss there uh, in another month or so and uh, so we're gonna wrap it up for tonight and um we may even uh tom send you uh, some of our questions ahead of time, perhaps, uh, and um, will that will give us a, a jump on on those because that that'll help us refine our own questions too. So, great! Thank you right. so much uh, for joining us.